Okay, so starting now with our strategy, a violent act occurs, an empathic act occurs, any of these categories, what was going on in the brain one second before? And of course, what you know we're immediately going to land in is right in the middle of the limbic system. And just as the Kluver-Busey syndrome from the 1930s, as we heard about last week, just as that syndrome, when you destroy the limbic system, you get completely inappropriate sexual behavior in primates, what those studies also showed was you get completely inappropriate aggressive behavior. Okay, so with 80-year-old research, we've now landed in the limbic system. What are the subregions that are relevant? The area that comes in at the top of the list immediately that we've already heard a fair amount about is the amygdala. The amygdala and its role in fear, its role in anxiety, that strange role in males of sexual motivation, but what the amygdala is most renowned for is its role in aggression. And as I emphasized last week, it is mighty interesting, I think, that the part of the brain which is most responsive to when you are scared is the part of the brain that generates the starts of aggressive behavior. Again, in a world in which no neuron may be, need be afraid, we're going to have a lot fewer aggressive amygdalas out there. What's the evidence? You know the drill by now. You go and you destroy the amygdala in an animal and you are incapable of eliciting aggression from them. You go and you do the same thing in a human and you get the exact same result. One of those dark, horrible chapters in the history of science, another realm of legally enforced psychosurgery. This was a trend that was very, very popular in the 60s and 70s, court-ordered amygdalectomies of people. And this was a technique where people would go in with a lesioning syringe into each side. The amygdala is a bilateral structure. There's two of them way deep in the brain and go in and destroy the structure. And this would decrease aggression. This would decrease all sorts of stuff. This wound up on the front page of the New York Times when around 1970, three neurosurgeons at Harvard wrote a letter to the New York Times pointing out there's this great surgical technique, which they were the pioneers of, where you could take aggressive humans and make them less aggressive with no other side effects. You could make them less aggressive, and haven't you been noticing that our inner cities have been burning and rife with violence? Maybe it's time to start thinking about doing some of these preemptively. This was a letter from these three guys from Harvard Med School. No surprise, not everybody sort of thought this was the swellest idea that they had ever heard. This generated this huge fight over the psychosurgical use of court-enforced amygdalectomies. And before it was over with, it had just as bad of a history as frontal lobotomies. People subjected to amygdalectomies because they were argumentative because they, as teenagers, didn't listen to their parents. They didn't listen to their teachers. Thousands of cases of these. The one thing that was clear was that, yes, indeed, aggressive behavior would decrease in these individuals. There would not be a whole lot of a person left afterward. So lesioning evidence. Stimulation evidence. You know the flip side of that by now. Now stick an electrode into the rat's amygdala and stimulate, electrically stimulate there, and you produce wildly aggressive behavior. And you see two equivalents of that in humans. And in both of these cases, stupendously rare. First is a very, very, very rare type of epilepsy where what you get is the epileptic focus, the place where the seizure begins, is in the amygdala. What you see is with most types of epilepsy, the place where, they, where it starts in the brain, a seizure, tells you a whole lot about matching with the behavior. People just before the onset of the seizure will get olfactory auras, two or three seconds of hallucinating an odor. That's a seizure that's starting somewhere down in the olfactory part of the limbic system. 
you see all sorts of cases. There have been documented cases of epileptics who see a mathematical equation for two seconds before the seizure hits, and that's an area of the cortex where it turns out. Auditory seizures where they hear two measures of music, the same two measures before it hits. What you see when you've got these rare epilepsies where the seizure begins in the amygdala is two seconds before the person becomes furious. They I can't believe, I am so angry. And then it happens. So uncontrolled stimulation in the amygdala, and you get some aggression there. Next thing that you see is evidence of the amygdaloid stimulation. OK, anybody ever hear of a guy named Charles Whitman? Any hands? Go. What are they teaching you guys here? Okay, Charles Whitman was once America's record holding mass murderer. And he was the best that we could come up with in the early 1960s. And oh, his records have been eclipsed by so many people since then. But he was once our gold medal mass murderer. This was the guy who, in 1962, I think, climbed up the famed clock tower at the University of Texas Austin campus and opened fire on people below, and then killed himself afterward. This was the first of the rounding up the neighbors to say, oh my god, he was such a quiet guy. He was such a nice neighbor. This was the first of the literal choir boys, my god, where did this come from? No hint of anything. On post-mortem, he was found to have a tumor in his amygdala. Another rare case of that, during the 1970s, there was an extreme leftist terrorist group in Germany called the Baden-Meyerhof Gang. And these were the two people who began it. And one of the two stupendously violent people, one of the two found on post-mortem to have a tumor in her amygdala. So these very, very rare cases of this fitting with this theme, circumstances that increase the metabolism in the amygdala, out comes aggressive behavior. More evidence. Now another strategy from the limbic lectures, put in the electrode. This is one that responds to electrical signaling, shows somebody something that evokes aggression, and their amygdala has gotten activated. Do the same thing now with a human, put them in a brain scanner and show them something that evokes anger and the metabolic rate in their amygdala activates. So you see all sorts of circumstances where you can document the amygdala as playing this role. Interestingly, the amygdala gets bigger, as we've heard, in people with post-traumatic stress disorder. And what you see there is also increased frequency of violent behavior. More evidence that the amygdala plays a role. And this was a very subtle finding. This was from, oh my god, the clock in the back. Turn around and look at that clock. Everybody run. OK, well, now that it's almost done, I'll mention the very last thing here. These were studies sh done showing, OK, people with amygdaloid lesions, they are very bad at detecting faces expressing angry emotions. They are more trusting of people than average individuals are. They are more likely to forgive. They are less capable of picking up on any of that information. And a wonderful study done by this guy, Antonio Damasio, again, one of the lead figures in the field, what he did was eye tracking on people with amygdaloid lesions. You get someone with this part of the brain destroyed, and they don't look at the eyes of other people. When they examine faces, they're looking at the nose. They're looking at the chin. They're not directing their gaze to be able to pick up accurate information about emotions. So what do we see here? The amygdala not only responds to aggression and fear-provoking stimuli, the amygdala is able to direct you to look for it.